And now, it's The Law Show on CL 650. A comprehensive look at everything you need to know about the law. Now, here's Sterling Fox. Ah, some familiar tones there. That's that's back to the 90s and the theme from the TV show, The People's Court. Remember Judge Harry? It's the law show here on CIL 650. Our guests from Murphy Batista kind of enjoyed that. Joe Murphy and Derek Ma in studio with us this morning. We're talking a, well, a lot of summer activity, summer stuff this morning on the program. And one of the big things that I wanted to get to, we're going to talk to, about dogs and dog bites in a little bit. But summer camp is, uh, is, a, is a reality for a lot of Canadian kids and their parents. When my brother and I were sent off to camp when we were little, we had so much fun it never once, not for one single second, occurred to either of us that mom and dad were just having a swell time without those kids around. And of course, they're, so everybody wins when the kids go to camp. But when we send our children to camp, regardless of the type of camp it may be, we are required to sign them up and register them and we have to sign all sorts of forms joe and i'm curious as to what those forms mean given that you and i have had this conversation in the past when it relates to those school policies where if you lose a finger you get five hundred dollars and so you better sign here or we send the kids off on a field trip derek and you've done that with your two um when we sign these release forms and they won't let the kids go to the camp or on the field trip, unless mom or dad signs the form, what's a, what, what are the forms about, Joe, legally? Well, the forms are uh, the reality that anyone who's running a program with kids, and, and a kid in, in the eyes of the law is anyone under 19, they want to get the parent's consent, and they also want the parent to waive the right that, that any claim will be made arising if, uh, from an accident or an injury. Parents have the authority to give consent, obviously. Sure. Um, But in British Columbia, and I think this is the case across Canada, a parent does not have the legal right or ability or authority to waive any rights the child may have if they get hurt. So when I have friends phoning me saying, my my grade five child is going on a field trip right and i've got this form and it's and it's also a release and i say to them you can sign that because the release doesn't matter you do not have the legal authority to waive any rights your child may have if they get hurt on so this why trip. would these forms pretend that we do i think it's it's habit it's historical and i think it, it they have an effect that if people think that there's been a release and if the child does get hurt and if they accept, well, there's nothing we can do because we signed the release, then nothing happens. But the reality is the, the release that a parent signs ha- for a child has no effect because the parent doesn't have the legal authority to sign off anything. And Sterling, it, it's sort of like a husband and wife. Does the husband have the ability to sign a release for the wife? And the answer is not unless she gives him that authority. Sure, yeah. So the parent doesn't have the child's authority and the court uh, and the law have set up a system where there's real protections about what deal a a child makes and is bound by, but the parent doesn't have that authority. So you you tell people who call you with these uh, field trip and summer camp forms, go ahead and sign the form because if push comes to shove and we actually have to take this to court, uh, it can be demonstrably proven that the signature didn't amount to much. I've had cases like that go to court and the insurance company didn't even raise the issue of a release sign because they knew it was it meant nothing. So again, Derek, it's, it's, it's force of habit that uh, causes schools and camps and other uh, institutions, for lack of a better word, that deal primarily with children to have these forms signed. Yep, I would agree with that. And also it's habit for a lot of the softball leagues Mm -hmm. the recreational leagues can you sign this waiver that says you can't uh, you can't sue us anymore and uh, even and when you go to a hockey game, isn't it? Isn't the fine print on the back of the hockey ga- ticket to say something about if you catch a puck in the forehead, tough darts, you can't sue us? Well, small print on the back of a ticket doesn't affect, it isn't effective um, unless the person's aware of it. And and there's um, cases involving injuries to adults on ski hills. Mm-hmm. And the hill has a big long release. On the back of the lift ticket, usually. Ba- yeah, but <laughs> for people who have a season pass, it's far more formalized. Sure. And the courts have, have ruled, and this is usually involving a tourist, unless they understood it, 
or had a good idea that it was there, they're not bound by that. Okay. So when uh, the, the kids come home uh, with that, that paper, and I want to go, I want to go, everybody else in the class is going, Dad, please sign this. Um, you sign it, right, Derek? Do I have to answer that? <laughs> well, you're not under oath if that's any <laughs> any relief for you. But, yeah, again, knowing the the legal implications, that's fairly harmless to sign it. And yet it seems a, a particularly useless exercise. Yep. No, no, I would agree with that. And we had an issue actually with our preschool once with that because I wouldn't sign the, ah. the, the form. And so they ended I'm up changing it. I'm glad I put you it. on the spot. Yeah, no, they ended up changing it in, in their policy. Um, and effectively what they were asking us to do is to say, we would never sue in any capacity at all. And I said, I, why would I ever do that? If someone was negligent and our children or anyone's children were hurt while under your care, they should be entitled to get their compensation for that. So what they agreed to in the end was to say, you would only sue us up up unto the maximum amount of our insurance coverage, which I thought was reasonable. Okay. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Can we move on? Because we're in the summertime here, and there's a whole other category uh, that is, is sort of summer-related. And, and, Derek, this is a file that you handle at Murphy Batista quite frequently, and it's the whole matter of dog bites. And uh, and it happens. It happens in the summertime. It happens year-round. But maybe in the summertime when more of us are out and c- circulating in parks and in public places with uh, strange animals that we've never seen or met before, and these encounters can sometimes go pretty pretty bad. So talk to us about what happens when a dog bite occurs. And again, when a lawyer should become involved. Yeah, the, the dog bites are a really frightening experience for the people that I've spoken to have mm-hmm. gone through it because in, in a matter of seconds, you know, maybe a minute, they've gone through this entire tragedy where a dog is latched onto them. If it's something like a pit bull, it can be a very vicious, a very ferocious attack that they've gone through. And it can be very, uh, just to be very despondent for everybody involved in that. So um, it's not a, a very, it's not a very simple event. In life, I think we see car accidents as something that happens regularly. Right. Um, but we get more angry when we see dog bites because, you know, why wasn't that dog properly restrained? Why was that dog off leash? Why was that dog around children? Right. And uh, usually what I tell people is just give us a call because that's one area where we would look at it more closely initially to see what's happening. Because back to what we talked about earlier, what we need to find out pretty quickly on is whether there's actually insurance or not that would actually even cover this claim for the person. Okay, well, let's let's stop and, and ask Joe about that. If I'm a dog owner, um, how how can I be insured against my dog flipping out and biting somebody and, and me being sued? Is my homeowner's policy going to cover that too? Yes. Really? Yes, the tenant's policy will cover it. Holy cow. Um, it will cover it if you've got a friend's dog that you're dog sitting mm-hmm. and that dog ends up biting someone because you didn't restrain it or you didn't control it enough, then you would be sued. And maybe the owner of the dog would be sued for having this man-eating dog. Right. So your policy, whether it's a homeowner or a tenant's policy, would cover that. Interesting stuff. Again, the magic of the homeowner slash tenant's insurance policy, just an incredibly valuable document. Uh, So, Derek, with a people's response to a dog bite, a very traumatic event, they're quite likely, quite a bit more likely to pick up the phone and I'm I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take this for another second and call a lawyer rather than having that same person being in a car accident, being knocked around and going, oh, well, you know, it, it happens. It's a car accident. So you're saying uh, a dog bite will generally uh, cause uh, a call a lawyer reaction much more frequently. Yeah, in my experience, I've seen people call me within a week of a dog bite and Generally speaking, most people don't call within a week of a car accident. So I've seen it happen a lot more, and I think it goes back to that whole issue about anger. You know, why did this happen? What could have been prevented? Um, Why was that dog off leash or not muzzled? Right. And in the case now, Joe, let me give you a specific example. Suppose now, again, with children, you have a a strong affinity for children. Suppose I'm out with my, my kids in the park, and we're just going for a walk, and some dog comes out of the bushes and starts chomping on my kid's leg. And I take a stick, and I beat the dog off, and eventually the owner comes along, and why are you beating me, my animal with your stick, et cetera? So, well, your animal attacked my kid. So there's a lawsuit there. Somebody's The kid's chewed up. We're going to take her to the hospital now, and Lord knows what that's going to entail. And this, there's the outraged dog owner going, you hitting my dog with a stick. So 
I mean, that one's not going to play out well, but there's definitely a lawsuit in that mix, isn't there? Yes. In fact, if you watch someone in your family attacked and injured, you may have a claim for the psychiatric or emotional injury you suffer by witnessing this. Interesting. Uh, it's called a nervous shock claim. It really depends upon there being a real psychiatric emotional injury, not just the initial fright or upset. Um, but again, you know, as Derek said, these events are terrifying to the person attacked. Yes. Because it happens out of nowhere. Uh, suddenly you're being attacked. The dogs can be very vicious, even if they're a smaller dog. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've seen cats that can go crazy and attack people. They can and a, scuff and you a up. 15 pound cat mm -hmm. is terrifying because it's all, all those claws. claws. You bet. Um, so, you know, it's a terrifying event. It, ca it can cause terrible injuries. We had a file a, a few years ago in the office of a young girl attacked by two pit bulls. She was about 15 at the time. She had very bad scarring, but her far greater injury was the PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder that she had that was going to be a lifelong problem for her. Absolutely. And you could understand, again, being attacked by these, in that case, two big dogs that ripped her, ripped her face, ripped her shoulder. Um, you know, I imagine you think you're going to die. Yes, of course. Um, so it's just, you know, these are... These are potentially devastating cases. Uh, in any event, whether it's a small dog or a big dog, they're terrifying cases. Right. And these, uh, the law says dogs need to be on leashes. So now, how did that case get resolved, Joe, where the, the, the little girl was attacked by two pit bulls? What, uh, what was the settlement or the resolution it to the case? It was a very, very substantial settlement paid by two insurance companies. The insurance company for the owner of the dog and the insurance company of the owner's friend who was supposed to be babysitting the dogs. Oh, okay. So but very, very large settlement, but this girl's life was devastated mm -hmm. by, by not so much the physical problems because she had plastic surgery sure. and the scarring was much improved, Right. but it's by this PTSD that was just terrible for this girl and, and understandable. Uh, Derek, uh, uh, let's flip the coin and look at it from the dog owner's standpoint. What protection can a dog owner uh, avail him or herself of so that should some kind of unfortunate aggression take place that the dog owner is at least covered in the event of a lawsuit. Yeah. And I'd like to answer that but also step back for a moment first which is Sterling they should look at what type of dog they have. Yeah, of course. Because what the law looks at is some dogs you don't expect them to, to bite someone. So if you have a little lap dog, mm. Lassa Apso, mm -hmm. and it bites your, your neighbor you probably won't be held liable for that because the law will say, well, we didn't expect that to happen. But if it was a pit bull, there's not that free first bite that's given to the dog because the terms they use is a propensity to harm. Right. And the pit bulls are known to be aggressive dogs with a propensity to harm. And, of course, some owners select that breed because of that reputation. Absolutely. So that's one thing they would look at is when you talk about protecting yourself, think about what type of dog you have. And then the more practical parts of it would be when you're out with a dog, have the dog on a leash. If you think your dog has some aggressive tendencies, because you would have seen it inside the home oh, or sure, whatever, sure. put a muzzle on the dog. Mm -hmm. Keep the dog close to you. Right. But in terms of insurance, is there anything? I mean, we there's pet insurance, but that's for when they get sick and, and cost a fortune to get better again. But can dog owners, can uh, what what kind of protection? Is it is it all about the homeowner's it's or tenant's about, policy? Correct. So make sure you have the homeowner's or tenant's policy. Which is place. why you want to have the maximum liability I was on just those say, policies. Yeah. It costs nothing, and it can be so, so useful. So if you, if you own a particularly aggressive type of dog, and, uh, and you, uh, well, obviously, if you have homeowner's or tenant's insurance, then the one favor you can do yourself is to increase to the maximum le allowable level the liability coverage that you carry, again, to possibly offset the risk of your dog behaving badly. Okay. okay. All right. We'll take a quick break here. It's The Law Show. Our guests, Joel Murphy, QC, and Derek Ma. Murphy Batista, LLP, is the firm Vancouver personal injury lawyers, all of them, and online. Check them out, murphybatista.com, while we take this quick break. There's more of the show still ahead. This is The Law Show on CL 650.